Okay, so hi uh, everyone. Today is June 10th and we are very happy to uh, provide another free webinar by Geosolutions. And today we're going to talk about best practices for optimizing performance with your server. Uh, for those of you that don't know about your solutions, I'm going to provide uh, an introduction about sorry, I'm going an introduction about uh, who we are, what we do, and then and then we will have Andre Aime to talk about your server. So your solutions was founded in 2006. We have offices in Italy, and since this year we have offices in the US, and we have four main products that we support, your server and all the plugins that are around your server, like your web cache, for example, Maps or GeoNode, your network, and we provide various ways that can support people that are implementing open source software, like enterprise support services, deployment subscription, uh, to guarantee, for example, that that user server installation is working properly, customized solutions, and professional training. We have actually more than 180 clients right now around the world, from uh, organizations, international organizations, to uh, big uh, corporations, and to also cities and others. We cross country, we cross country, <laughs> we cross cut uh, a lot of different uh, industries, as you, you know, think a lot of uh, customers, you will be able to touch a lot of different domains like space, metocean, defense, government, and so on and so forth. So we have past experience on Wait, these domains. Yes. We are seeing the presenter notes instead of the main screen. So the slides are there. Okay, better. Thank you. Good, thank you. Uh, we strongly support uh, open source. Uh, it's really in our core, so that's why uh, all of the products that we have are part of, of open source and most of them are OSGO projects. We are OGC members, we participate in working groups and we are actively funded by OGC and that's how I met uh, the Geo Solutions people because they wanted six years ago when I was at OGC, they wanted to have Geo Server as one of the implementations that has been prototyped with some OGC services. So that's how I met them. Uh, USGIF, uh, we are also members and we support critical standards to GeoWind. So we have done some profiling, for example, work also in the umbrella of OGC. We have the lead developers of these main products, GeoNode, GeoServer, Maps, and GeoNetwork. We have vast experience in a lot of geospatial data, raster, vector, uh, the spatial database, databases. OGC protocols and experiencing performance and scalability when we're talking about big cloud, big data and cloud. We're about 25 staff members. Most of them are software engineers. Um, as you can see here, the main staff. And um, also to provide a little bit of context about your server, like two days ago, George Percival, the CTO of OGC, uh, tweeted this, right? Some uh, blog from Geos here, which is they have a product that goes through the web and tries to see where are the OGC services published and how are they being published? And surprise, surprise, uh, they discovered that your server has the most data sets in the world. So if you're thinking, about hmm, can this open source support data? Is it robust enough? Well, I mean, it has most of the data sets and um, it has, is in, open, in the open source world has the, no, is the number one deployed tool. So that's cool to, to see. And also to provide a little bit of context, a lot of our, of our customers, uh, they have, for example, raster data and they want to know how to optimize it. They know, they understand the process about uh, seeding and how do you structure duties. So some of this is going to be covered today as an introduction uh, with Andrea. So I hope you enjoy very much uh, this webinar. And finally, a little bit of advertisement. We're going to be on June 12th providing also an introductory training about your server and map source. So if you don't know about map source, which is a very cool dashboard, uh, you can uh, go to FedGeo US and then join us. Um, also, they have a very good agenda if you're interested in, in a lot of activities, in particular in the US. Okay, so with that, Andrea, uh, please uh, take control. I think I'm going to pause sharing, stop share. Okay. So I'm going to share my screen. Uh, no, you have to re-enable me as host. 
I can't even share right now. Okay, you should be good now. Yes, sir, I am. All right, so you should be seeing the slides. Louise, please confirm. Yes, perfect. Okie dokie. So this presentation is called User in Production. We do it here is how. During uh, the next uh, 30, 40 minutes, we are going through a, a number of steps that you should take in order to optimize the performance and scalability of a GeoServer installation. These steps are ordered this way uh, because this is the order that you should follow when doing the optimizations. In particular, we are going to start with data optimizations. If you don't work on data optimization, doing the rest, it's unlikely to work. Once you've done data optimization, you can start looking at data and styles, like caching, resource control, and so on, in this order. So typically, each element provides an order of magnitude uh, performance difference more than, than, the, than the next one. So in order to see progressive improvements, you need to follow this order. If you start by, I don't know, adding resource control, it's going to help some, but you're not going to see a, a huge difference unless you also do raster and vector data uh, optimization first, OK? All right, this understood, let's go through the items. So how do we prepare raster inputs? Um, there are many ways that you can feed the data into GeoServer. You could be feeding PNG and JPEG as data sources, or you could be feeding a GML grid or ASCII grids into GeoServer. Um, uh, and uh, all of these are uh, going to to work, but not, not all of them share the same performance characteristics. So in particular, um, uh, yes, I'm sharing my screen and uh, you should be seeing it. Um, Luis, can you confirm it's still visible? Okay, thank you. Thank you, Randall. Okay, so each one of them has different performance characteristics and uh, uh, some, are, some are good and uh, some are bad. Okay, it seems that most can, can see the screen. Um, okay, so in particular, if you try to feed the PNG and JPEG, they are uh, bad formats for input. They don't have inner tiling, they don't have overviews, or at this point, they don't have uh, internal overviews and the like. Uh, the ASCII formats are bad because there is lots of parsing to do, and so on. Uh, there are formats which are, well, are not bad, like ECW, because ECW per se, it's fast, it compresses well, but uh, did you know that you have to buy a, buy a license to use it on a server-side software? The uh, plugins to, to read uh, ECWs are free for the desktop software, but they are not for the, last, for the server ones. So, again, do you want to use something that you have to pay a FT license for? It might be a good idea. It depends on your use case. It depends on what uh, storage and uh, um, data transfer cost, cost you incur to. But you have to do the math. It's not just uh, uh, an immediate decision. Um, uh, JPEG 2000 is another format uh, which is very common. It's uh, common with the satellite imagery. It's extensible, rich. It's not always fast. It's uh, most of, more of a data transfer uh, format. It can be fast, but if you want to go real fast, you have to buy a, a proprietary library called Kakadu. It's very good. It's quite expensive as well. Again, it's it's a matter of uh, comparing what are your costs with uh, with the uh, storage and otherwise compared to the cost of the license. It might be uh, suitable for your use case, but just keep on, uh, keep in mind that you have to go and um, and go uh, get the, that library. Uh, there is also an open source version that can uh, of a library that can uh, uh, decode JPEG 2000, and it's improving, but uh, it's still a far cry away from uh, Kakadu at the moment. So what do you do? Well, what do we do is to use GeoTIFF uh, most of the time. Uh, GeoTIFF is a very uh, rich format, um, and uh, 
it has been seen a more and more usage over the, uh, the past years. With GeoTIFF, you can do overviews and tiling, uh, and uh, uh, you can do very large files um, using the big TIFF extension. Um, uh, so it, it, has the, um, it has support for a, a variety of compressions, which is also good. You can choose between lossy and lossless. So it's, it's very flexible, it's free, and the GeoServer is particularly well optimized to handle it. So what do you do typically? Well, uh, for TIFFs that are, let's say, small, where small could be up to 20 gigabytes or 50 gigabytes, you can stick everything inside a, a single GTIF with internal tiling and internal overviews. Um, the, the, the trick here is not to have too many tiles because otherwise the, the GTIF uh, indexing the header grows too big. So you wanna grow big, you wanna have a very large GTIF files use large internal tiles then. Use a 512 or 1024 pixels of internal tiles. Uh, for smaller GeoTIFs instead, you can stay on the typical 256, for example. When you start breaking the limits of the single GeoTIF, you can start going towards a mosaic of GeoTIFs. So an index that contains the footprint of each file plus all the files. And with the mosaics, you can grow very large the, the trick here is not to open too many files at the same time. So if you display the rasters uh, when you are zoomed in and not, let's say, at a global scale, you can have as many as you want, because typically when you are zoomed in, you're gonna open just a few files. And at that point, the mosaic can literally have hundreds of thousands of, uh, of uh, images without any problem. The problem is if you try to display them when you start to zoom in out, because you open more and more and more files. When you start opening more than 100 or 200 files to generate an image, uh, the composition time and opening time and so on, they begin to, to show. It's not a good idea. Then you can switch to a pyramid. A pyramid is this structure where you have multiple uh, zoom levels. Each zoom level is a mosaic of its own. Each zoom level has a different uh, number of files. Uh, the full resolution has all the files uh, possible, could be hundreds of thousands. And then the next zoom level has uh, one fourth of uh, the native zoom level, and then uh, one sixteenth, and then one sixty fourth, and so on and so on, up until the tip of the pyramid, which is just one file. This provides the best balance because as you move up and down, the number of files that you open uh, goes with you. So you uh, you go native resolution, fine. You're looking at a small set of files and you open a small set of files. You open the, the whole world, you look at the tip of the pyramid, it's just one file. So as long as you keep control on, of the number of files that need to be opened in order to display an image, you're fine. Um, uh, I already um, described this, so you can read it later if you want. Um, and uh, I want to point you at our training material. Uh, there's a link here which provides you a guidance on how to uh, do the data preparation using the GDAL utilities. In particular, you are going to use a lot of GDAL Translate, GDAL Ado, GDAL Warp, and so on, to optimize the data for, uh, for serving. You might be uh, wondering, okay, uh, what about uh, COGS? Oh, or in other words, cloud-optimized geotiffs. Um, the COGS uh, are, uh, a particular type of GeoTIFFs that has an internal organization which is optimized for serving them with minimal data transfer out of eventually a uh, blob storage such as H3 or Azure blobs. Uh, the, uh, the file organization of a COG is excellent. It has internal overviews. It has a, a very well organized uh, structure. The index is at the, the beginning. Uh, you have all the tiles uh, properly laid out, there are no holes, and so on and so on. So it's a, it's a good idea to use a COG even if you are not using cloud. Um, in GeoServer, we have this module called uh, GTS3 GeoTIFF, which supports reading GeoTIFFs out of an Amazon S3 bucket. It works really fine as long as you uh, open a single file, but it does not support mosaic in them at the moment. We are working. Uh, to improve support for uh, native COG layout and support mosaics of COGs, so stay tuned. 
Okay, so this is um, this is it for uh, raster inputs, or at least what can what I can say quickly. Uh, what about vector inputs? Vector inputs is more of the same, in that uh, you want again a format that's fast to parse, that's uh, uh, that support fast fast extraction of, of a small data a small subset of um, data and that eventually scale, scales out uh, very nicely when you are trying to deal with uh, large datasets. So slow formats in general are WFS cascading, GML, CSV, GeoJSON, anything that needs to have network communication or that needs to parse text. They will work fine for small datasets. They will just not work fine for large ones. So what are the good formats? Well, the classic shape file is for many uh, purposes still a, a good format for just serving. It's horrible for uh, editing, but uh, for just serving in uh, several cases, it's still good. Then there is GeoPackage, uh, which is, well, the better replacement for shape file. Then there are all the spatial databases and all the NoSQL databases as well. Anything that has a spatial index will do and that is uh, preeminently um, binary. Um, you might think, okay, MongoDB stores JSON. Yeah, but it actually stores it in, in a binary way, so it's fine. So when you are working on DBMS, uh, I'm going to say something like trivial, like obvious, but if we keep on stumbling into people that forget to uh, add the indexes. So why is my table slow? Why is your server so slow? Well, maybe you forgot to add a spatial index or you are doing alphanumeric filtering. Maybe you forgot to add an alphanumeric index to the column that uh, uh, decides which roads I should be displaying at which zoom level, right? Um, uh, and uh, again, this should be obvious, but uh, uh, it keeps on popping up. Also remember that if you're doing something very heavy, like uh, having a number of, of joins, you need to have proper index layout on the, on the foreign keys, and uh, uh, you need to size the database machine so that it can do all these joins quickly, because GeoServer cannot respond only as fast as the database can. Well, it will take a bit more time, of course, but uh, you get the idea. Um, just ever use connection pools. Connection pools are important because obtaining a connection to a database can be slow. Uh, so just ever keeps persistent connections. Uh, I have a couple of links on how to optimize them. Uh, just as a reminder, these persistent collect connections are long lived. So be mindful of any hardware that uh, might cut uh, TCP connection that uh, it thinks are mm, too long lived and uh, uh, or databases that are dropping the connections on your face without telling you anything because again they think they have they have been too long. Uh, server gets extra performance by keeping them open let the hardware sorry let the database and the network hardware keep these connections open. Um, in terms of shapefile versus geopackage, which is better? Well, actually, shapefile has an edge over geopackage. I know that geopackage is, is very good and, and it's rich, but there is one use case where shapefile excels compared to geopackage, which is trying to display lots and lots of vectors at a low zoom level. Like in this case, what you are seeing here is not the Texas, is the road network of Texas. It's just that there are so many roads uh, that you will basically see the shape of the, uh, of the state. In this particular use case, shapefile blows the socks away of everything else because we optimized it to the bone and there are no uh, limitations to data transfer and, uh, and uh, we have a number of optimiz optimization in place. The moment you start zooming in, then the other formats catch up with shapefile and actually do better. So when we are seeing roads at a reasonable zoom level, then uh, the better spatial indexes that are available in PostGIS and GeoPackage show up and we get the same performance or better. 
Also, shapefile typically is not indexed on the attributes, while GeoPackage and PostJS both support uh, indexing on the attributes. So they are the better format if you have any filtering that's done on the attributes. The other use case where they shine is WFST. If you are trying to modify concurrently the contents of your data, please don't put it in a shapefile. GeoPackage is going to do Geo, uh, PostGIS or any other relational database are just designed for it. If you need to go really, really big, like think uh, the whole road network of the entire planet, then uh, uh, um, some extra tricks are necessary. In particular, the pre-generalized data store plus overview tables. What's the idea here? I have uh, a roads table, the OSM roads, covering the entire planet. It's um, hundreds of millions of records. I cannot handle it efficiently at, in a multi-scale map. So say, for example, when I'm fairly zoomed out, I only see the motorways, then I start seeing the highways, then the, the local roads, the, then also the, the paths and, and whatnot, uh, everything that's secondary. Um, putting them together, uh, in in a, a single giant table is not going to do it. Uh, we we tried and many people tried and it's slow. So what do you do? You prepared overview tables just like we prepared overviews for the rasters, in which we put simplified geometries. That's the first element. But the second and most important one is that we only have the records that we need for that scale range. So for example. If we are looking at the roads around Paris, France, uh, the uh, most generalized tables will only contain the motorways. And then the Gen 1, which is a bit less generalized, will contain more roads. And Gen 2, which is a bit less generalized, uh, contains uh, also uh, more local roads. And uh, the Gen 3 will contain even more roads, probably all the roads. The, um, this way, uh, we don't have to sift through all the road kinds to only get the, uh, the, the motorways when we are the, um, at the global level. And uh, I know what you're thinking. There are indexes for that. Yes, there are. They are not fast enough if you, if you have a very large data set. You don't have to concern yourself if, if you have a relatively small data set, hundred, hundreds of thousands of roads. But if you go to hundreds of millions, you got to start thinking in these terms. Um, uh, Imposum, which is a tool to um, import uh, OSM data into PostGIS, has configurations that allow you to define these overview tables, defining the generalization tolerance, and a SQL filter that we catch only the records that you need. And then in GeoServer, there is the pre-generalized data store, which allow you to expose what looks like a single layer, uh, but it's in fact backed by multiple tables, which are going to be, are going, are going to be cherry picked based on the current uh, uh, map resolution. So if I'm looking at a very detailed um, map, I'm going to use the OSM roads, the base table, which contains everything. But if I'm looking at the, the whole globe, then I'm going to use OSM roads Gen 1, which probably contains only the motorways. It gives you the illusion of a single layer, and it gives you the performance of having the overviews at the vector level. OK, let's say we have optimized the rasters and we have optimized uh, the vectors. What else there is to optimize? Well, if we are rendering maps, we have to think about the styling. Uh, generally speaking, you have to use heavily scale dependencies because all the web maps are multi-scale maps. So depending on your zoom level or your scale denominator, you want to display certain things and hide others. So please use eagerly min and max scale denominators in SLD or the equivalent uh, in the other styling languages. And make sure that the more, more expensive rendering options are only used when you are fairly zoomed in and when you are displaying few items on the map. That's going to give you both a good looking map and a fast map. Uh, a map that is full of details 
is typically not readable. Think about the, the map of the uh, Texas roads, yeah, well, that I had here. You could not even say they were roads. It was, well, something, too much data. Labeling uh, with conflict resolution is another expensive uh, operation to do. So label with care. Don't try to label everything possible and uh, just let the engine uh, do the conflict resolution. It's a way, um, but uh, you are going to uh, move uh, m most of the work uh, at runtime. Uh, think about enabling detailed labels, again, using scale denominators. And uh, uh, think about uh, uh, using with care max displacement, which makes the, the uh, labeling engine move the, the label in case of conflict to find a free place. If you enable a large search, it's going to have to try lots of places. That's going to take time. Um, Another thing that uh, can chew, in particular memory in this case, it's using multiple feature type styles. It's a very common cartographic trick to do cased lines. You prepare two drawing surfaces. On one, you draw the thick lines. On the other one, you draw the thin lines. And then you superimpose them. Uh, sometimes people get carried away and create, uh, I don't know, 10 feature type styles. Uh, for the same uh, map because they want to z order things in a certain way and uh, they want to do cer certain visual tricks it's all fine and dandy but it multiplies the memory you you need for the rendering by by a factor of 10 so be be careful about it uh, use only what you actually need to use and finally there is z ordering uh, sometimes you have uh, um, data layers in this case we have rails and roads which are two separate data layers which need to be z ordered to match their ordering in the real world so this is a particular let's say complicated or unfortunate crossing in germany there are like 15 different zoom levels in this thing uh, GeoServer, when instructed to do z ordering has to order on the database by the z level then do a merge sort between the two layers and then paint in the right order of the roads and the, and the rails and do the proper casing and so on. That's another expensive operation. So try to limit it to uh, when you are actually visualizing details of the map and not when you are uh, particularly zoomed out. Uh, another final thing is rendering transformations. Rendering transformations allow you to take uh, data and process it on the fly to uh, get a more uh, complex display or a different display. In this case, we are displaying uh, wind barbs out of a uh, data source, which, has, uh, which is actually rasters. So the, the pixels are turned into points and then uh, turned into wind barbs. Uh, it works fine as long as uh, your uh, raster data source has overviews. It can be pretty heavy if it doesn't because there are many pixels to be turned into wind bars. So again, be careful about it. Generally speaking, all the rendering transformations can have a cost related to how much they are processing. Make sure that you are feeding them optimized data sources with overviews. Okay, so you have the data sorted out, you have the styles, and maybe it's still not fast enough, or maybe it's not scaling. Uh, uh, to the level that you want. You cannot still do 200 concurrent users that you promised to your customers or that your SLA demands. So what do you do? You do tiling and caching. With tile caching with GWC, you prepare uh, tile-oriented maps as, oppo as uh, opposed to WMS full screen maps. Uh, tiling um, allows you to prepare the map uh, each tile just once, store it on this and just send over the result. This comes typically with a significant speed up. It can be, let's say, 10 to 100 times, depending on what data source uh, you have. And assuming your tiles are already cached, if we have to build them on the fly, well, then it's the, the cost is more or less the same as doing WMS, right? This is suitable for layers that are mostly static, or in other terms, layers that change slow enough that we can recache the tiles and that have no or few dynamic parameters. In a typical get map, you can have many 
dynamic parameters like changing the style, having SQL view parameters, having SQL filters, having time and elevation, having format options, and so on. If you can limit the options of your client to a reasonable amount, then you can do tie caching. You need to think about uh, space and time when you do tie caching. It's important because the tie caches can take, may take a lot of time to generate and can consume a lot of disk space. We have prepared a little spreadsheet, but just remember the number of tiles on the size and megabytes of your pie cache can grow really, really big. Uh, and if you don't have enough disk space uh, to host it all, well, maybe you can prepare in advance only the first few zoom levels and then let GeoCache uh, dynamically create the missing tiles uh, on a, on a as-needed basis. Most of the customers, most of the users, typically start more or less the same map and then start drilling down. They typically go towards cities, towards ports, towards uh, highway areas of interest, and maybe uh, several areas down in the wilderness are never uh, displayed, so there's no point in actually uh, preparing the package for, that, for them. Um, once you have the tie cache on disk, you can serve them very fast to the client. But what if you are not actually going to serve them at all? Isn't it even better? In other words, what if you serve them once and then the client is, stops asking for them? You can do it with the client-side caching uh, headers. And uh, you can tell the, the client, please don't ask for this tile for another hour. So if the user keeps on zooming in and out, the, uh, the client will stop generating traffic. That's the ultimate optimization, not having to even transfer the tile. Um, I see that there are questions popping. I will look at them and answer them at the, at the end, unless there is anything that needs urgent. Okay. Um, when doing tile caching, uh, you need to choose the right format because you basically remove the most of the uh, processing time, but you still have all the network transfer. So what is the best uh, format to reduce the network transfer? Well, depends. Uh, you could use JPEG for background data, uh, for example, or the photos, anything that's raster. You can use PNG8 for anything that's vector. Do you have a mix of uh, raster data that also needs transparency, which JPEG does not support? Well, we have a custom format called the JPEG PNG that will choose on a tile by tile basis whether to use JPEG or PNG. Uh, this is going to uh, impact both how much data transfer you do over the network, but also how much you uh, how much disk space you're going to use. And then there are vector channels. Vector tiles is this notion that you embed in a tile not the, the pixels, but a vector description of the, of the data, including attributes, suitable for the resolution of that particular tile at that particular zoom level. Um, it can speed up the encoding significantly because PNG or JPEG encoding are often a significant portion of the time it takes to, uh, to actually produce the tile. Um, the vector tiles can uh, be produced uh, at, um, with the less zoom levels because you can over zoom them. Once you are close to their native resolution, there's no point of going beyond. So you can reduce the, uh, the amount of uh, zoom levels, let's say from 20 to 14. Uh, vector tiles are typically more compact, but not always. Uh, don't think that you're just gonna do vector tiles and they are automatically gonna be smaller. You have to set up scale dependencies and the like. So the vector tiles map need to be designed. You just, it's not just, hey, I'm going to use vector tiles and it's going to be faster. No, you're going to use vector tiles on a very large data set with no configuration and it's going to be slower. I promise. You, you need to design it. Uh, that said, a number of interesting um, um, Characteristics. There is only one downside. It's a it's a, an open specification. It's not a, a, a standard. It's not an OGC ISO standard. So it's probably not something you want to use in an environment that's very standard friendly. 
So, okay, we are going to produce tiles. They are going to be PNG, JPEGs, vector tiles. Where do we store them? Well, we have options. One option, the default, is to um, store them on disk. And uh, you have, uh, uh, again, two options. Let's say you have a cluster. You could set up a shared disk uh, cache on a network drive, or you could have each node have its own cache. Uh, pros and cons, well, the, the, the shared cache typically suffers when there are multiple nodes writing on it. Um, uh, we have seen literally a uh, network file system go down due, uh, due to the heavy load of uh, tile generation. Um, but uh, the, the, the upside is that uh, you are sharing the cache. So if a tile generated by node one will be read by node two on an as neat basis. So it's faster if your uh, workload is mostly read. If you have a workload that's mostly write, because maybe you are tile caching something that's volatile and you have to drop the tile caches uh, often because the data changed. In that case, it's probably better to have a small cache and uh, keep it uh, on single uh, node disk. So each one has its own. There's also the option to go object storage. Uh, so if you are deploying on Amazon or on uh, Azure, or even on your local um, cluster, you could use Minio. Uh, GeoWebCache uh, Geo can support all three and store tiles in these uh, object storage options, which are typically uh, significantly cheaper than the equivalent to file system, especially in the cloud. Okay, so you have tile cached, uh, and uh, uh, then it's all good. Well, maybe you still have to make sure that uh, server is not gonna overcommit um, and try to do something that your hardware is not capable of supporting. Typically, uh, when you are deploy a server, the, um, um, let's say, response times uh, can go up as your number of concurrent users go up, and that's normal. At one point, um, sorry, I'm not the response times, this is throughput. So the throughput goes, goes up as, as the more users you have until you reach the limits of your system. Uh, the network starts being the bottleneck, or it's the disk, or it's the, the CPU. At one point, you max out your hardware. When you reach that point, uh, your, your hardware is at maximum capacity. What, what if you push harder? Then you will start seeing uh, uh, the throughput go down because your uh, system is going to be so busy trying to switch from one task to the other that the actual work is actually going to be uh, um, uh, affected and uh, your throughput is going to go uh, down as your response time, which is the blue line, is going to explode literally. So ideally, you would like to reach the, the peak point and then stay there on a flat line. How is that possible? Well, in, in GeoServer, uh, there are uh, resource limits that you can set um, uh, on a service by service basis. And you can tweak them uh, if you start seeing uh, out of memory errors or unresponsive service and the like. Um, in each service, there, there are limits that you can set. So, for example, in the WMS configuration panel, you can set the maximum amount of memory that a single get map request or the single tile generation request will be allowed to use. In this case, 64 megabytes you can set a maximum rendering time, in this, uh, rendering time, in this case, 120 seconds, which is reasonable. Who's gonna be there waiting for the, the map after, after two minutes? You can drop it. And also, uh, GeoServer tries to uh, handle errors like reprojection errors during the pr production of a map. If there are too many of them that are gonna kill the, the rendering time and uh, you will have a very few outputs to, to speak of. So again, it's probably a good idea to limit the, the amount of tolerance that GeoServer has towards rendering errors. For features, you can set the maximum number of features that's going to be returned by the service. And for WCS, you can limit both the size of the uh, raster that is read and the raster that it's produced. Why the two? Because in WCS, you can scale up and scale down the rasters, so you could be reading five pixel and produce one million if the scale up factor is very high, 
or the opposite. Reads uh, I have a huge amount of data to produce a three by three grid if the scale down factor is very high. So you want to control both of them and refuse requests which are gonna use either too much of the input or too much of output. Then there is the control flow plugin because these um, resource limits are very nice, but they, um, they are useful for the single request. Your hardware is gonna be put through the paces and start failing if uh, you have too many requests. So you wanna have a, a subsystem that refuses too many requests and instead of executing them, starts queuing them. Control flow does exactly that. It can recognize the type of request and it can be configured uh, not to, to run, for example, more than 16 get maps in parallel. Anymore, they will be queued and you can configure it so that if a request stays in queue for more than a minute, let's say, it's gonna be dropped. This way, uh, if, even if you stumble into peak traffic or access traffic, at the very least, your server is not gonna go down and it will keep on responding at optimal performance. When you reach the peak, you are either, go, uh, you are either in an anomalous situation or you need more hardware, and uh, if you are on the cloud, you're, it's probably time to start looking into elastic scaling, of course. But at the very least, if you uh, set up the limits, your system will not go down. Finally, uh, there are uh, tweaks that you can do uh, on the deploy. None of them uh, will do any good if you didn't look at the previous items. There are many people that look for the magic JVM flag tweak. There is no such a thing. There is no go fast option in Visual Virtual Machine. You can make it better as long as you've tweaked everything else that I presented so far. Uh, one of the uh, items which is important is the Marlin renderer if you render a lot of vector data because it optimizes the, um, the way a GeoServer translates vector data into the raster PNGs that you are producing. Uh, it's part of uh, JDK 9 onwards, so you don't need to install it. And it's part of our installer for, uh, uh, for Windows and uh, let's say the Beam package, it's already in there. Otherwise, if you are doing your, uh, your own Word deploy, please look in the documentation for it. It's gonna make your map rendering uh, scale up better and uh, be faster on even on the single request. Or just use OpenJDK 11, which is an LTS long-term support and it does already contain Marlin. The other thing is, please upgrade. Uh, we are continuously tweaking the performance of GeoServer, and we know by the statistics, like the GeoCR1, that there are lots and lots of old GeoServers around. Please update them. Uh, you're gonna get a boost of performance just by doing that, most of the time. And uh, I'm gonna skip that slide, and I think that's it. Wow, and Andrea, have, thank you. We have 15 minutes for questions. I can see that there are already three. Okay, this one. What are the requirements to have a GWC working with simple filters? Right, so when you, uh, when you go into the configuration, uh, okay, let me switch from uh, sharing just the PowerPoint to sharing my screen entirely, just a sec. Uh -huh. And now, think about it. I probably don't have a Geo server running, but I can start up one quickly. So basically, when you configure your uh, file caching, you need to tell GeoCache that uh, SQL filter, which is typically used Sorry. which is typically used to do filtering, uh, is to be considered a um, filter parameter. If you do, then GWF cache will generate a separate file cache for that particular filter. And every time you throw a new filter, uh, it will generate a, a separate parallel file cache for it. And that's the nature of the file cache uh, after all. I mean, um, 
if you change the filter, you change the contents of the tiles, and thus they uh, they have to be a different tile cache. So, sorry, this Windows laptop is really slow. So when I create the tile cache here, I will do add filter, SQL filter, set up a regular expression, and then I can be lazy and say, hey, whatever, any SQL filter will uh, will um, will be matched and generate a separate tile cache. Or if I know that my typical SQL filter is done like uh, my attribute equals to a number, uh, you can do something like this. And uh, it will generate a tile cache only if the SQL filter uh, is actually matching that structure. Uh, in which order would you prioritize hardware optimization for serving some terabytes of satellite imagery? For example, SSD versus HD, memory, network, CPU, GPU. Does a GPU even matter for some um, some extensions? Okay. Um, you wanna you wanna have uh, SSDs uh, because if we are talking terabytes, uh, the the file system cache which keeps some of the file system data in memory, it's, probably, it's not gonna be a match for your storage. So you need fast storage. So I would prioritize SSDs. Um, network, uh, yes, you need fast network if you are storing on a network uh, storage. Uh, CPU is gonna be important if you do lots of reprojection. GPU is not gonna matter. GeoServer is not using it at all. So in this order, um, Fast storage, fast network, uh, CPU. If you if you find that you are doing lots of on the fly reprojection, uh, can you sort of cache WMST request? Yes, it can. Again, you have to configure it so that it does. So, again, when we are setting up the um, the tile cache configuration, we need to tell GeoServer to do caching based on the time parameter, which is what WM, uh, um, yeah, WMST uses. And in WMST, you can have multiple dimensions. So you could use uh, elevation. Sure, uh, you can do it. And uh, do uh, caching based on the elevation, and so on and so on. You could use, uh, you could have uh, uh, custom dimensions like, uh, I don't know, dim runtime, and again, you can configure it. Basically, any combination of the three parameters that I have here will generate a separate cache. And then it's up to you uh, to uh, keep the caches in control. Uh, typically, in time-based system, you have a moving window set of data. So when you drop the old data, you also need to tell your cache to drop the, the tiles pertaining to it. Or you configure just the, the disk quota and eventually those tiles are gonna get old and the disk quota is gonna uh, remove them. Uh, is there a link in the slides uh, that will be shared? Um, we are gonna share on our, on our blog post or on Twitter. Uh, Luis, please confirm. Uh, the, uh, the slides and also the full recording of this session. Yes, and we, we will send you an email with the link. Um, okay, is there, uh, Jack asks, uh, if there is any tooling that you recommend to validate the deposit indexes you expect to be there for vector R present, is it just explain or do you use any tooling? No, uh, we typically just use um, explain analyze. It's interesting to use explain analyze because explain per se gives you uh, the plan that the query planner is uh, expecting to use. But uh, um, and, and you can have a look at it, but uh, uh, you don't see um, the difference between the number of uh, hits in terms of uh, these pages that it expects to find and the actual ones which sometimes can be very large. Uh, if the 
Query Planner expects to hit 10 pages and uh, the actual execution hits 1,000, you want to know because probably you need to run an analyze on the table. Um, uh, and then, well, in, as I said, in that case, uh, you, you have a problem. Uh, maybe it's uh, some tunable in PostgreSQL that needs to be fixed, like the, the random access cost. Or, uh, uh, as I said, you just need to do a vacuum analyze to, to make the PostgreSQL update its statistics. So generally speaking, you want to know both what's the plan and whether or not the plan was any good. So you, you normally do an explain analyze. And there are tools online. I don't remember the website in particular. Um, it's a strange name. Let's see if I can find it uh, quickly. Yeah, it's called Depez. This one. Um, this tool, this site called Depez can take uh, the results of your uh, explain, analyze, and point out the discrepancies between predicted and actual cost and uh, give you some interesting direction on what to um, uh, check. So let me let me copy this into into the chat. Do, 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 here, where the chat? Where did the chat go? Yeah, lost it. There. Okay. Uh, Alessio asks, uh, could you suggest a way of stress testing GeoServer simulating concurrent requests using JMeter? How can you reproduce a real world multiple users request to test out your server instance performances? Okay, so normally what we do is to set up a JMeter with the increasing number of uh, users of threads. It's not gonna be uh, an equivalent of real world users because the real world users typically take poses and look at the map. JMeter is going to be relentless and just go and uh, hit the server without any pause, but it's a very good way to find its limits. JMeter and GeoSolutions, GeoServer, we have this in our training material here. Okay, so our training material uh, goes through the steps of um, setting up uh, JMeter. I'm going to add this one to the chat as well. Okay, um, so yeah, the, um, the training material shows you how to repeat over and over the same request with multiple threads, which is um, an easy way to, um, uh, to prepare a simple load testing. Uh, what's more interesting is using uh, CSV files with bounding boxes widths and heights to randomize a bit the, the areas and the zoom levels and, and uh, the size of the requests to generate a, a, a more varied uh, input. And you can prepare a few thousand of these requests using a Python tool that we can share. And, uh, um, and, uh, and yeah, uh, find where the throughput peaks and starts dropping. And uh, that's one very important indication because that's where you want to lock down your control flow configuration. So yeah, it's, it's all here in, in this training material. Um, where in this flow would be to set up uh, parallel GeoServer engines? Do you recommend it at all? Okay, so we do set up uh, clusters of GeoServer uh, very often. Uh, there are two ways to do it. One is to scale vertically and one is to scale horizontally. Uh, scaling vertically means buying a very big box, like, I don't know, 128 cores, uh, 64 gigabytes of memory, and, and, uh, and stuff like that. If you stick a single GeoServer on it, um, it's going to suffer because there are a few internal synchronizations, but you can uh, set up on the single machine several GeoServers on different ports and then use a load balancer uh, like HA proxy 
to uh, make it work uh, as one. Or you can have your, your load balancer at the hardware level in the network. So that's one approach. Uh, the other approach is to scale horizontally. So you start adding boxes. You start with small boxes, let's say, thinking out loud, four cores, 80 gigabytes. And if the load goes up, you start adding uh, other boxes in parallel and you have a load balancer that, uh, that distributes the load. Uh, that's typically done on the cloud, especially when you use elastic scaling. It checks what's the load on your server and spawns new servers and uh, automatically wires the load balancer for you. And when the lo load goes down, it starts reducing the number of instances dynamically as well. So yeah, uh, it's, uh, it's very, it's setting up parallel geo servers is done very often at the minimum to uh, provide uh, uh, high availability. So two, hard, two separate hardware machines serving the same data set and same layers. And uh, you can do more to get more performance out of it. Actually more scalability, the single user request, I'm not gonna get any faster, but you can serve more and more users. George is asking, um, if the client is a C-sharp application or a Java application or a web application, they, are there any different tweaks? Not really, GeoServer doesn't, uh, doesn't know uh, what the client is, it just gets an HTTP request. Uh, so it's, it's more like uh, what's the style of uh, data handling and display of your application. Uh, rather than the technology it's built on. So is your uh, client-side application doing full screen get maps or is it doing tiling? Is it fetching vector data out of the WFS or uh, fetching raster via get map and so on? That's your typical driver. The technology of your uh, client application does not matter much. You server only sees HTTP request coming in. Uh, can you quickly explain uh, in which cases you need to install native JI and uh, or its replacement of JI XT? Uh, have you benchmarked? Okay, so the, the, the answer in 2020 is that you don't install native JI. The reason is that uh, it doesn't handle no data uh, in, in your rasters. And uh, uh, I think that nobody in, uh, as part of the core developers has used native JI for years. Also native JI is available on Windows only for 32-bit systems, which is very limiting. You can only address two gigabytes of memory. And on Linux, it's available for both 32 and 64. Uh, but again, as I said, mm, uh, it hasn't been used by core developers in a, in a long while. GeoSolutions hasn't been deploying with native JI in years now. So I would suggest you do the same. Or, I mean, you can do the benchmark and realize that uh, native JI is faster in some cases and it will be, uh, but if it starts misbehaving, you're basically on your own. So it's sort of an unsupported uh, solution by now. Paolo asks, what is the limit of memory, if any, we can assign to Java to increase performance? Um, that's actually a, a, a matter of philosophy in how you design your Java application. GeoServer has been designed so that it's a streaming architecture. What does it mean? It means that it reads a bit of data from the source, produces a bit of output, and then goes back, reads a bit of the input, produces a bit of output. And it never keeps the entire data set that it's playing with in memory. It just tries to flow the data from input to output as much as possible. It does it when rendering data, it does it when, uh, when using WFS and generating GeoJSON and so on. So typically, GeoServer does not need that much memory. What is the use case that actually needs memory is the get map, paint, painting the maps, but not for the data for the drawing surface. So if you are doing lots of full screen uh, requests that are, I don't know, with very large screen, 2000 by, uh, by 1000 or, or, uh, or more, then that memory needs to be allocated. And maybe in your style, you have multiple feature type styles. There will be an overlay for each, which will multiply the memory usage. So you have to consider that memory usage 
width, by height, by the number of feature type styles, and you have to multiply by the number of concurrent requests you, you want to you wanna serve, and that's your main memory uh, sync. Uh, as long as you can deal with it, add one or two gigabytes for everything else, and you're fine. So typically, in GeoSolutions, we allocate four to eight gigabytes to GeoServer, uh, because we tend to uh, deploy on smaller boxes and go elastic or anyways put on the side all the small boxes and uh, and be, no, be done with it. It also helps uh, garbage collector to, uh, a lot because um, having to deal with a very large um, heap typically slows down the, the garbage collector. So get a box with, uh, with a bunch of, mem uh, of memory but leave it to the operating system to do file system caching if it's useful for your application. Like if you are uh, uh, reading rasters, if you're reading shape files, anything that hits the disk, let the operating system have some memory to cache those um, files. If you're going off databases all the time, then it's not going to help too much. You can just have enough memory to run a server. OK, I don't see any more questions. Good, Andrea, thank you very much. Um, I think uh, you did awesome being able to put all that material in almost 40 minutes, so thank you. And thank you all of you that attended and provided these very good questions. As we said, we're going to make these available to all the participants uh, in the next uh, two days. Um, there, there is one more question. Do, do uh, we want to answer it and then we close it? Um, debugging, okay, let's try. Uh, this one uh, probably needs uh, more time. I would suggest to ask it on the view server user list, on the mailing list. But uh, if you are um, serving raster layers and you're going out of memory, um, you're either uh, allowing too many concurrent requests, which is a, 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 a thing that we have seen, and then you, I would suggest you to install the control flow and limit the number of concurrent requests that your server is uh, trying to process. Um, uh, especially like if you are uh, generating an output JPEG, at one point the entire raster has to be in memory for JPEG encoding. So uh, you, you need to be careful about how many concurrent requests you allow. Uh, if there is a memory leak, uh, uh, you need to take a, a memory dump using uh, JMAP and then again share it on, on the on the list or uh, even better get a support contract to have someone look into it and eventually fix the leak if there is one. Good, thank you, Andrea. So thank you again, um, um, everybody. And uh, we'll see you maybe in the next webinar. Take care. Bye-bye. Thank you for Bye. uh, coming.